Hello. Hello, and once again, thank you for joining us today for another Sussex Vision Talk. This talk series is part of the Worldwide Inner Initiative, which regroups online seminars in many fields of our science. The initiative is about to reach 150 seminars, hosted since March, and many others are still to come. You can already watch most of them as a podcast. You'll find the links in the descriptions. So today I will be a host. My name is Maxim, and I'm a member of the Baden Lab. Today, I am, we are very happy to receive Thomas Soller from the University of Tübingen. Back in his youth, Thomas obtained his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt. He then worked as a postdoc with Richard Maslund in Harvard, who later came back in Europe at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Albenburg, who worked as a research fellow with Rinfried Denk, the inventor of Kofoton microscopy. He is now a full professor at the Institute for Ophthalmic Research and the Center for Integrative Neuroscience in Tübingen. Thomas is mostly known for his work in retinal signal processing. His laboratory has established an impressive methods catalog for optical measurement of light-driven population activity based on calcium sensors, complemented with single-cell electrophysiology, immunocytochemistry, and large-scale data analysis. With his collaborators, he aims to unravel the function and organization of retinal microcircuits toward a better understanding of the underlying computational principles. Thomas is also a close collaborator of House, and we are happy to share his inclination toward open access and open source philosophy. I will finish by saying that we are all looking forward to the next ERM, the European Retina Meeting, which Thomas and his collaborators will host in the beginning of 2021. So good afternoon, Thomas. Thank you, Maxime. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, hello, everywhere. Um, as Maxime already told you, um, my lab is focusing on computations in the retina, especially in the mouse retina. But today, I'd like to uh, summarize our ongoing work, um, partially very fresh work, um, in our attempts to connect the work in the retina with visual ecology. And the project, or these projects I will tell about, um, are collaborations between several labs. So first of all, it's a collaboration with Laura Busse's lab in Munich, and as well as with the long-term collaborators here in Tübingen, with the labs of Katrin Franke, Philipp Behrens, Matthias Bethke, also with Alex Alexander Ecker, who is now in Göttingen, and more recently with Fabian Sins. So it's a quite a big collaboration. Okay. Um, I think we all agree that uh, when we study the visual system, we have to take into account that animals are adapted to their specific habitats. You can see here a, a, an, a, a figure from a recent review article that um, Tom Phillip and I wrote together, where we show adaptations of different species to their environment here in terms of um, a um, high acuity center in the retina, where it's located and how pronounced it is. And clearly these animals have to deal with different environments and this their different environments are also imprinted in their visual system. So um, their environment is reflected in the representations in their visual system. So this is what we have to consider when we try to understand how, for example, a mouse um, sees the world. Um, approximately seven years ago in 2013, we started to, to look a little bit into what is actually interesting for mice instead of just stimulating it, for example, with very artificial stimuli. And in our first paper, we looked in, in food receptor um, responses to, to different wavelengths. And I'll show you in a moment what we did. But I want to um, show you first a couple of sentences from the review we got for this paper. So the reviewer said here, mice have very poor vision in general and are colorblind. Excuse me, Thomas, I will stop you. You are not uh, sharing your screen here. I didn't realize it was not transferring here, sorry. From when on? <laughs> the beginning, apparently. Yeah, now it's on. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> My host didn't, didn't tell me earlier about that. All right. OK, so I'm sorry. So I go one back, one slide back, I think. So this is a slide I was just referring to, different visual environments, different specializations of the retinas, for example. So we always have to consider the environment and the animal that lives in this environment. And this is also true for mice, which became a very important model in visual neuroscience in the past couple of years. So to this reviewer's comments, which I thought were very telling at this time, 
So the, he claimed or she claimed that mice have very poor vision in general, are colorblind, live in nests and navigate hidden tracks using their whiskers in the dark and not their eyes because they rarely see the sky. So this was kind of revealing how people conceived mice as animals in visual research. And um, in the end, we were able to, um, to publish the paper, but um, I think the times have changed quite a lot and I'm really excited to see more and more mouse studies where um, complicated recording techniques are used and where different behaviors are tested. So I think uh, we're now on the right track of studying mice um, as an animal in their visual world. So what do we know about mice? So in the retina, mice have three types of photoreceptors, two cones and one rod. And um, one of the, the short wavelength sensitive um, cone is, uh, has its peak in the UV. And this is a point that I want to make right at the beginning. If you show a mice a TV screen, it won't be able to see the blue component. So you're, so you're missing quite a lot if you are using a human made device for displaying stimuli to mice. So this is my first point. The second interesting point about mice is they have this gradient of obscene expression across the retina. So in the dorsal retina, they are, the dorsal retina is dominated by um, green obscene expressing cones, while the ventral retina is dominated by UV um, obscene expressing cones. And in addition to this gradient, there is still a population of cones that are in both parts of the retina UV sensitive. And this is here illustrated by labeling from a paper from Silke Haverkamp. This is not a very unusual setting. So you, we, at this point, we usually say, okay, we have a lot of animals that have also this division in the, in, into a UV sensitive uh, lower part of the retina and the green sensitive upper part. So for example, this is to a certain degree in rapids, but also in hyena and many insects or in shrews. Um, recently, Heinz Wessler pointed out that there is a nice paper on mice that I almost forgot about where um, it shows that several mice have this, this division here. For example, these two mice, the house mouse and the steppen mouse, but there are also um, mice that don't have this division. Um, for example, here, the wood mouse has um, no gradient in, in obscene expression along the retina and this uh, pygmy field mouse even lacks the s cone. Interestingly, um, the two lower mice here, they live in a, in a wooden area while the upper mice, or except maybe the house mouse, they live in a, in a wide field. So they are more interested in, um, in an open space and what appears on the horizon. But this is just a side note. It just means that also, if you're saying we're studying mice, we have to consider what species and how are they really adapted to an environment. Um, this month, I think, um, a new study on the mouse photoreceptor distribution came out. This is from Wei Li's lab, um, where he showed that not only this, this strong distribution of, of the um, opsin with the green opsin up here and the UV opsin down here, but he also showed that the postsynaptic circuitry, so the bipolar cells that spe specifically contact the true S cones are, um, have, have a high density here in the, in the ventral retina, which means there's not only this expression of UV opsin, but there's also a higher density of the circuit that processes um, UV signals in the ventral retina. And to point this out again, this all the circuit is, is ignored if you use a normal uh, screen to display a stimuli to mice. So this is the photoreceptor side. What is on the behavior side? On the behavior side, there have been a couple of studies. The first study probably was here, the study by Jacobs and, and co-workers, where they showed that mice indeed can discriminate short wavelengths and long wavelengths. And more recently, there was a study from Denman et al where they confirmed this result basically that mice can discriminate colors in the UV and the green range. Okay, so the mouse has everything it needs to process color. Um, and now we want to know what, in, what is the, the color, the chromatic properties in the environment. And I will briefly summarize this, this study that we did in 2013. So in 2013, we um, built a little scanning device. So um, basically a spectrometer that scans the the environment as shown here. And then you have a full spectrum of for every pixel and you can calculate with the um, absorption curves of the mouse opsins. You can uh, calculate what, how does the image look like for a mouse? And this is here the mouse view of the scene in the woods. 
We then separated the S, so the, the S cone band and the M cone band here into images and then looked how is contrast distributed in these two uh, bands and in different parts of the visual field. And in a nutshell, we found that in the upper visual field in the UV band, that the contrasts are distributed in this skewed manner. So there are more dark contrasts in the sky region compared um, to the ground region. And in the green band, we found that here, especially in the, in the lower part of the visual field, the contrasts are more symmetrically distributed. And in parallel, we had done um, recordings in mouse uh, cone photoreceptors using a transgenic mouse line where we can read out the output of cones um, with a, uh, under the two-photon microscope with a um, calcium indicator. And we displayed light flashes of different contrast and different color, for example, dark contrast and bright contrasts. And then we recorded the responses. And what we found there is that many of the S cones in the ventral retina, they are actually biased towards dark contrasts. While the uh, most M cones in the dorsal retina, so the green cones, they show a more symmetric response to these contrast steps, which means already at the level of the photoreceptors, this bias in the statistics, in the contrast statistics, is reflected um, in the function of the photoreceptors. And what we suggested at this time was that this might be a useful feature um, for mice if they want to detect dark contrasts in the sky. And dark contrasts in the sky are usually something that's not good for a mouse. That could be, for example, a bird of prey. So we liked the study very much. And um, shortly after that, also Tom went to his own lab. Um, and we followed um, similar things in the two labs. And it became clear that this approach on the long run is um, needs more. So one issue is illustrated here. So this is the field work with the scanning spectrometer with Tom here on the right side. Um, the fact that he was able to drink a beer means that the whole, taking the whole picture took a terribly long time. Yeah? So what we actually need is um, we need movies of the mouse habitat. So we need a camera that is able to record chromatically correct movies of the mouse habitat. And we need a way to display these stimuli in a spectrally correct manner, but also in a spatial way. We need a spatial stimulator. And this is what I want to talk about in the next um, half an hour or so. So first about the simulator, because that's already published. So we recently published this paper as a collaboration with between the labs of Katrin Franke and Tom Baden. Uh, Maxime here was also involved. So we published um, open source designs of a spectral simulator that can be adapted to the needs of the species. So it has up to six spectral channels. Uh, it uses a light crafter and a light um, light engine uh, with different LEDs to project the light stimulus, for example, onto the retina or into a chamber with a, with a zebra fish. Um, and this has the capability to produce uh, spatial resolved patterns, as you can see here, and it's highly adaptable. And if you're interested in this, there is a GitHub repository with all the details and it's also being updated constantly. So for our purpose for the mouse, we build a version that can um, stimulates the blue cones, the UV cones, and the, the, the green cones um, uh, separately. Um, and at the same time, is able to use um, fluorescent imaging to record signals from different calcium indicators. So this is um, done by spectrally separating the stimulation light, for example, here in the, in the yellow part to stimulate the green cone and the UV part to stimulate the UV cone, but also to record green and red fluorescence. In addition, we have also um, temporal separation of the stimuli and the, and the scanning, and you can read all the details here. So this is the stimulator does not only work for electrical recordings, but it can also be used for imaging experiments. And in addition, so we, we have um, detailed worksheets in that repository that explain how you can calibrate um, the stimulator in order to change the gamma curve of the stimulus representation, or for example, to calibrate the intensities so that you can directly calculate in uh, photoreceptor uh, excitation with your two wavelengths. Um, this is a demonstration that this really works. This is again recordings from mouse photoreceptors here, very similar as we did in the 2013 study. We see here the responses to a green sine wave and the UV sine wave uh, for cones in the upper, in the dorsal retina or in the ventral retina or somewhere in the middle. And you see how the sensitivity of the cones shifts from green 
to UV sensitive. And from the calibration, we can also then determine what would be a silent substitution stimulus. And you can see here that we can separate the response of the, the, to the green um, stimulus in the green cones from that to the UV stimulus and UV cones. So um, using these uh, calibrations, you can very precisely project a natural scene onto the retina. Um, last week, um, Katrin Franke presented also in the series her work on color vision. I just want to repeat this because it fits so nicely to, um, to the need of, of, of uh, studying color, color vision in mice. So Katrin showed um, work from Marie Lee here, who's a student in both our labs, um, where she recorded um, cone photoreceptors across the whole retina. And she found that, um, that basically like the opsin distribution, the um, dorsal cones are green selective while the ventral cones are more UV selective. But for the surround, the result was different, resulting in um, color opponent um, cone responses, so centers around color potency in the ventral cone photoreceptors, while dorsal cones are not um, or to a lesser degree color opponent. So this um, was already done with this kind of stimulator and it nicely confirms that um, the ventral retina is indeed able to pick up chromatic signals. So, so much to the uh, color, uh, to the uh, stimulator. So now how do we get uh, movies of the natural environment? So basically we want to do this. We want to stick our head here in the place where mice live in the ground. And then we want to capture what is relevant for mice, like the direct environment and also bad things possibly on the sky. And we want to do this in a way how mice see that. So with the appropriate resolution and in the chromatic channels that are required. So the, the best way obviously would be to take a mouse, put a camera on the head and put it here in the field and record what it sees, which is uh, obviously not that easy. So we decided to go uh, a simpler way. So we thought, what, can, what kind of movies can we record that capture more or less what mice see when they move around? And for this, um, we looked into eye movements, not directly, but we looked into the literature. And there are very nice papers just recently coming out that study uh, eye uh, mouse eye motion, motion in, in high detail. Um, and um, as it turns out from the, from the last couple of papers, there are at least two different kinds of eye motions. So mice uh, move their eyes um, over long stretches of their behavior in order to compensate for the position of the head for head tilt, just to stabilize the gaze um, relative to the horizontal plane of, of the field of view. And this was very nicely shown here in this paper from Maya et al. And just recently, um, it was shown that mice also do something else. They use the head and their eyes to do um, to perform saccade and fixate patterns. So this is something we, we're not considering here, but this is, I think, um, in terms of behavior, extremely interesting. So the just to go to the first point here, so in that Maya paper from 2018, they showed um, by recording eye motion and the, the head position that you can basically predict um, the eye motion from the head position and vice versa, which means at, at um, times when the, the mouse is roaming around and it's just it's moving the head because of motion, it um, tries to stabilize its, um, its, the image onto its retina on the horizontal plane of the retina. And this makes the job for us a little bit e easier if we want to record movies from the environment. So what we did was we say, we just consider these eye movements and we um, built a camera that is mounted on a gimbal. So this is here Yong Rong, um, a student in my lab, um, so he and um, CC um, built this camera um, in the last couple of months. So this camera is sitting here at the bottom of the stick. This is a gimbal. Uh, you see the gimbal here. This is the camera. And it, this gimbal keeps the camera always stabilized um, uh, relative to the horizon. So no matter how, um, the, when he walks, this, the whole thing is shaking. The camera is always stable. And the lens, this is a fisheye lens, sits here on the bon bottom of the camera. So you can bring it extremely close to the ground. So you can walk around and move the camera along the ground um, and record uh, the scenes. The camera is actually two cameras. It's built from two Raspberry Pi cameras. One is here, one is here. And they're sitting uh, behind two spectral filters to um, select um, the bands that are, relative, that are um, meaningful for mice. So the UV band and the green band here. 
we have a dichroic in the middle to split the image into these color pathways. And here you see the fish eye lens that takes the image. Um, so how does, do these movies look like? Um, the next slide shows an example. So this is the, the whole fish eye um, lens movie on the Raspberry Pi camera. This here is the V channel on the left here. This is the green channel. And this is the overlay of these two channels. And you can see um, the, the camera is very stable towards the, the, um, the ground to the horizon. Um, let me forward that a little bit. I cannot forward it now. OK, but you get the point. So um, Yongrong and, and CC went now and to very different scenes um, close to tubing and took uh, scenes um, of the environment um, at different times of the day, mostly um, during the day, but also some scenes at, in, in the morning and in the evening. So then we took these me uh, movies and, and pre-processed them. So as, we, as I said, we used two cameras. That means we have to align them spatially and temporally. For the temporal alignment, we record signals from two LEDs that are built in here that we can use as synchronization markers and then um, re really assign the, the frames of the two cameras to one single overlay frame. For the spatial alignment, um, we use features in the two frames and then um, overlay them in a non-rigid pixel-wise alignment manner. And for the spectral calibration, we use um, defined LEDs and, uh, and a spectrometer. And I will show you this um, a bit in more detail here. So um, we, we know the sensitivities of the camera due to the filters here. So we have LEDs for which we know the spectrum very precisely and where we can tune the intensity um, uh, very precisely. So we can record the, the LEDs with a camera and then get calibration curves for the intensity, where the intensity on the camera is related to um, power of the UV and U the green LEDs. And with this information, we then can turn the raw images from the camera into the calibrated images. And I just show you the same scene here, gamma corrected for better visualization on the screen. So this is the, the calibrated image from the camera. And here in comparison, you see the image from a scanning spectrometer again. So like we did in the earlier paper, we took a couple of scenes with a spectrometer. So we can compare the intensities in every pixel to the camera images. And you can see very well that they're matching quite, quite nicely. And then we looked at different features of the scenes like grass, trees, sky, and compared the calibrated images with um, the um, results from the spectrometer and found um, that, that we can correct the images spectrally very well. OK. So um, we took a lot of different scenes from different environments. This is an example here. So we have single trees in, in, in a grassy area. We have also um, uh, uh, footage from, from uh, scenes where the grass is very high or from close to the forest. Um, so we, we took these scenes and first looked at the intensity distribution along, the, along the, the vertical axis. And this is shown here. So this is a, one movie as an example where we take um, the, the intensities in the two channels here in the upper and the lower um, visual field. And what you see from these plots here, so with the green intensities and UV intensities plotted, you can see very nicely that in the lower visual field, um, these two chromatic channels they correlate quite nicely. So here you have a high correlation between green and UV intensities, while in the upper visual field, uh, the correlation is not as clear. So you have um, uh, much less uh, correlation in, in the intensities here. The second thing you see is that um, at the ground here, usually the intensity range is, is lower compared to what we see at the sky, um, at least in these clear sky areas here or with a few, of, a few trees. Another thing we noticed is that the brightness of our scenes is quite different. Um, and we wanted to look at the, at the scenes in a more organized way. So we decided to divide the, the movies up into three categories. So a category with low intensities, mean intensities in the two channels, a category with medium intensities, and a category with high intensities. So these are just divided up by the mean intensity in the, in the channels here, just by dividing up the histograms. But you can see already from these uh, example images that they also represent um, slightly different scenes. So in the low group, you find usually scenes close to the forest or uh, in shady areas, while here in the high intensity scenes, you find 
areas where the, the, the where there's little grass on the ground, high reflectance from the ground, or where the sun comes, for example, from, from the back. So in our analysis, we always consider these three groups um, of intensities. Okay, so the first thing we looked at was how is contrast distributed, distributed in different parts of the visual field. And for the following analysis, we always focus on, on image crops from the upper and from the lower visual fields. So we just consider central, I mean, these, these, these areas here. Um, the main reason for this is that we have distortions due to the fish eye lens towards the, the side. So we wanted to focus on parts where there's little distortion. Um, this, show, this shows example images, image crops from the upper visual field and the lower visual field. These are the UV and the green channel. This is the scene um, overlaid. And then we can filter um, these scenes with uh, different receptive field sizes. And in these receptive field sizes, we calculate the contrast. So we use here the RMS contrast, the root mean square contrast as a standard measure to determine contrast in natural scenes. So this is this, the, the same scene here now filtered with these, um, uh, with these um, receptive field filters. And you can see here how the contrast uh, is highlighted in the, in the two channels. And this is here the difference between the two channels. Already from this observation, you see that there's much more going on in the, in the upper visual field in terms of RMS contrast. Um, this even increases when we use larger filters. When we use here 10 degrees, um, 10 degree filter, you see that the contrast in the two channels gets, gets higher. And this are, are here the histograms for the contrast in the UV in the green channel. Again, the distribution of contrasts is, is much more diverse here and much broader in the upper visual field compared to the lower visual field. Um, so we did this now systematically for the different intensity scenes and for different receptor field sizes. So the range of receptor field sizes we, we picked here ranged from something that would um, correspond to the smallest receptor field size we would have in the mouse retina up to something that is approximately a receptor field size in, in further stages in, in the early visual pathway of the mouse. Um, and then we looked in, in detail for the distribution of the contrasts in the two channels, in the upper and the lower field. And I just show this for the different intensity ranges and for two different um, uh, receptor field sizes. You can see that the larger the receptor field size becomes, the more these distributions get different. And they are more different here for these low and medium intensity scenes and less difference for the high intensity scenes. We can summarize this also in, um, in plots where we um, show the RMS contrast for the UV channel in the upper visual field. Uh, these are the solid lines here as a function of receptor field size. And you see with the increasing receptor field size, you get a higher difference in contrast uh, for the upper visual field. And this is similar for the medium and less so for the high um, intensity scenes. Um, since we are looking here only at the medium of the distributions, we also wanted to have a more unbiased measure of how different the distributions of contrast are in the two channels and the two um, visual field parts. So we used here the Jen jensen Shannon divergence as a measure of difference between um, distributions. And you can see here, this is the, this, the difference in distributions in the upper visual field between the UV and the green contrast and is much higher than in the lower visual field. And this is also true for the medium scenes. Okay, to summarize this, we have the high um, RMS contrast in the upper visual field in the UV channel, and it increases with the receptor field size of the filter. And we also see that UV and green are much less correlated in the upper visual field. And less correlation means there is chromatic information that can be used um, by the mouse. And these findings um, resonate quite well with what Katrin presented last week in her presentation about color vision in the mouse. So this is the work um, from Claudia here in, in Katrin's lab. And this was the paper that was just published um, the end of last week, where she showed that there are ganglion cells that have color opponent responses and that these cells are predominantly in the lower um, part, in the ventral part of the retina. So you see an example for one of the ganglion cells that showed um, um, high frequency of color opponent responses. And here is the summary of, of the multiple cell types that she found, um, ganglion cell types 
you see here the red dots mean that there is a color opponency um, in many of the um, ventral retinal ganglion cells, which means there is a this this fits extremely well to um, to what we see here that there is a lot of contra, um, chromatic contrast present in the upper visual field, and this fits as well to the behavioral experiments that have been done um, in this um, study by Denman et al, where they showed that the color discrimination of mice is much better in the upper visual field than in the lower visual field. Okay, so the next step was, we looked also at the contrast distribution in terms of positive and negative contrast. For this, we used a different measure, we call this on-off contrast, which basically describes um, whether um, there's a positive or negative contrast in, in a certain region of the, of the study field. Again, we have these example images from the upper and the lower um, visual field. Here are the overlays um, um, measure, I mean, analyzed with a, the, the degree, uh, with a sorry, receptive field of two degrees here. These are the, the filtered maps. And you see again, there is higher contrast um, in the upper visual field compared to the lower visual field. And again, this contrast increases with receptive field size. Um, here's the same scene filtered with 10 degrees receptive fields. You see the bias here in the, in the histograms. So this is a distribution of, of uh, on-off contrast for UV and for green. You see this, this um, bias towards uh, dark contrasts in uh, many upper visual field scenes, which is um, similar to what we found in this 2013 study already. While in the lower visual field, both distributions are much more uh, symmetrical and also narrow. Um, so to do this more systematically, we looked at low, medium, and high um, intensity um, scenes from the upper and the lower visual field. You see here um, the distribution in the upper visual field for the UV channel is much broader and skewed towards um, uh, dark contrasts. This is also true in these scenes here, a bit for the for the green for the green channel. And if you look at larger receptor fields, you see again, this, this difference is, um, is increasing. So when you look with larger receptor fields at high, uh, at um, the upper visual field, there's a, a predominance of dark contrast or bias for dark contrasts. Um, and this is something that has been described earlier, for example, in the paper by Ratliff in 2010, that there is a bias towards dark contrast in natural scenes. We find that this dark contrast also is increased with a receptor field size. And in general, this, this dark bias shift, um, as I said, fits well to what we found in the photoreceptors um, already earlier, but it fits also to what we see in the ganglion cells. So we um, took, um, so when we plot the, the distribution of on-off contrast here on this axis as a function of um, uh, receptor field or filter size here from small to large receptor fields, you can see here that um, there is a, there's a bias towards dark contrast already in these, in these histograms for the low, high, uh, medium, and high um, uh, filters that we use to analyze these scenes here. But when we take um, the data that was published in, in the study by Baden et al. in 2016, where we recorded a lot of ganglion cells, we can also look at the, at the relationship between the on-off index, which is something similar to the, the on-off contrast here. And we have also receptor field size of these cells. So when we plot the same plot here for the, for the real cells from the study here, we find actually a similar distribution. So there is, is a bias towards dark contrasts. And when we um, look at which cells are present here that have a bias towards dark contrast, these are actually cells with large receptor fields. So this is the, the on-off index of the, of the real neurons recorded as a function of the receptor field size. And you can see that the larger the cells, the re cells receptor field size gets, their, 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 their um, on-off index um, is biased towards dark contrasts. So again, uh, we think that this uh, distribution of contrast that we see in the natural scenes of mice uh, matches very well uh, with, the, um, with, the, um, with neural representations at the level of the retina. Okay, so um, we did also one further analysis because we wanted to know if these, um, these contrasts could also be picked up um, by a neural network. 
So we set up um, a convolutional autoencoder network. And the idea was here, we, we um, trained it with scenes from our natural environment and we looked how well it can reproduce these scenes here. But at the same time, we, we put a bottleneck here in the middle. So we um, restricted the information transfer between these two layers um, uh, by different parameters to see whether the, the model still learns important features um, of the input movies. Um, so as a measure of, of performance, we compared the input and the output images. And this is shown here for different levels of, 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 um, um, of uh, regularization, which we used to, to, uh, to make the bottleneck between these two layers narrow. So um, when we have almost no bottleneck, we can reconstruct the scenes very well. If we decrease the information flow here very much, we get basically no risk reconstruction. So we picked um, a parameter combination where we still get reasonable images reconstructed from the original movies, but where we restrict the information flow or make the bottleneck very narrow here already. And then we checked what kind of filters does the autoencoder um, learn from the movies. And this is an example here for, for this combination of parameters. So these filters can be viewed as receptor fields. And what we found was that if you train this, this autoencoder with movies from the upper visual field, we find much more often um, color opponent filters here. So this is an example that responds um, in opponent ways to UV and to green. Yeah? So we did this systematically for different parameters and repeated this experiment. We found consistently that training this autoencoder with upper visual field scenes um, makes it, um, allows it to learn color opponent kernels. While if you use scenes from the lower visual field, you very rarely get color opponent kernels. And to us, this is a different way of, of um, showing that there is inter interesting information that neural networks in this case can learn from the different parts of the scenes. Okay. So this was all about movies at, uh, recorded at daytime. We also took some movies close to dusk and dawn. And the reason why we did this is, first of all, this is when, when mice are also very active. But the other reason is shown here in this, in this plot from a study by Johnson et al, where they show that towards um, sunset, the, um, the band in the, in the blue UV range is uh, relatively increasing towards the long wavelength band. So the, the, um, there is a relatively high ratio of short wavelengths close or, or close after or close before um, sunrise and sunset. So these are example images that we took at um, dawn in this case. So you can see here, um, the sun is slowly rising in this, in this um, sequence of images here. This is the UV channel and this is the green channel. And you see already from these images that UV channel, the sky is much more homogeneously illuminated compared to the green channel. And we um, looked at this also more quantitatively. So at different time points, the intensity at this line here from the sun towards um, uh, away from the sun is, is plotted. And you see that the UV intensity along the sky is usually much more homogeneous. And at some points, it's even a bit brighter than the green um, wavelength here in this, in this range. And um, in terms of our RMS contrast, the RMS contrast here in these regions away from the sun is higher in UV channel compared to the green channel. And again, this is increasing with the receptive field size. And so this suggests that um, UV channel is quite useful also at these low light levels, especially around sunset and um, sunrise to detect um, dark objects in the sky. And we tested this uh, by flying a drone into the field of the camera. And this is here an image of the drone. It's a dark drone. You can see um, very clearly it's, it's much better discernible here in the UV channel compared to the green channel. So from this, um, we, we suggest that UV channel in at, at least at these light levels might not be that important for color vision in the classical sense, but it might be an extremely useful channel to detect dark objects in a, a relatively homogeneously illuminated sky. Okay, um, so in the last slides, I want to show you what does the retina think about our natural movies? Because so far we just analyzed the movies, but we didn't ask the mouse what it thinks about it. So 
the next slides are very preliminary and I just want to give you this as an outlook because I think this is an exciting approach. So we took our movies and this is an example, the same um, crops that we used to analyze um, the, the different contrast properties and use them as a stimulus for, for the mouse retina as a hormone for ganglion cells. So this is an example of a stimulus movie playing on, the, on our stimulator. Um, we had a certain, so this, the whole range is here 30 degrees of visual angle. Um, we have um, several test clips, test sequence and training sequences. And we play this to a field of about 100 cells in the ganglion cell layer labeled with a calcium indicator and then uh, imaged uh, with two photon uh, microscopy. And these are experiments that also Claudia um, did here in the lab. And this shows you that the cells actually like the movie. So this is um, a movie um, presented to a field in dorsal retina and to a field in the ventral retina. And I hope you see here the cells blinking, but um, there's quite some activity while the movie is playing um, in, in, in the, on the retina. So the, the retina they actually respond to the movies that we think should be um, ideal for a mouse retina. So to analyze the, um, the activity in these um, neurons, um, we again used um, a CNN, a convolutional network, um, neural network model um, that was um, motivated by the, by the retina, retina structure, basically. So you have um, a mosaic of cell types with um, the same, of the same type, and they cover different parts of the visual, spe uh, visual field. So we read out the network at different points. Um, and a key function of this network is that um, it consists of a featured, uh, feature space that is shared by the different neurons and it is learned also jointly by the different neurons. And this, this concept of using this fair shared feature space um, was um, developed here in this, in this work by David Klint in a, in a collaboration uh, with Alexander Ecker and Matthias Bethke and it's published here as this paper. The whole modeling framework that we used for the analysis um, was developed by the group of Fabian Sins here, and it's called here N Fabric. Um, so this this um, model was uh, restricted, so it can use um, 16 kernels per color channel, so in total 32 um, channels. So how do the responses of this network look like when we when we train it? Um, uh, with the neural data from the ganglion cells. So this is an example fingerprint of, of such, a, such a neuron here. So these are the, the responses to a moving bar and a chirp stimulus. So these stimuli we still play in order to compare them with, um, with our older data set. And here you see the response of the neuron to um, a small section of the movie. So you see here the UV mean intensity and the green mean intensity of a small uh, movie um, uh, sequence. And in gray, you see the, the actual response of the cell. And in red, you see the predicted response by the model. Um, and here, we calculated MEIs, the most exciting images of that um, are predicted. So basically, the movies that are predicted to excite this specific, specific cell type um, the best. I mean, you can understand them also. They look like receptive field filters, but they actually represent um, the best stimulus. You see the spatial uh, organization of these stimuli here and the temporal time curves. So in this case, this would be an on-cell. And the last image is, is showing just a frame from the movie and it shows where this, um, the, the model cell was located within the, um, within the image and this is in the center where we recorded cell. So this is, um, this is a good result. Um, so we have movie, um, such recordings from the dorsal retina and you can see here that we get different cells um, that respond to the movies and we get also different MEIs. So these, these are on cells, here we have two off cells. You see that the prediction um, by the model of the responses is quite good. We see also cells in the ventral retina here um, and, and if you compare the, the time trace here the, for the green and the UV in the, ventral, in the dorsal versus the ventral retina, you can see that also the green, um, uh, here the green response is much higher as you expect in the dorsal retina, while here the green re response is lower. You see a stronger UV response. Also, this, this matches to what we expect. So these um, MEIs, these most exciting inputs, they're not only stationary images, but you can also visualize them. So this is an example for one of the cells 
um, this is the stimulus that this cell is supposed to respond to ideally. Um, so this is an off cell here. And um, in, in one of the very last experiments, um, we also found what we think is a color opponent cell. So this is, this is an example fingerprint for this. Here you see the two uh, MEIs. You see they have of opposite polarity in the surround and in the center. And you see here the MEI um, um, animated. And you can see um, that the green and the UV um, stimuli look quite different here. So we think this is very promising, but it's also very preliminary because um, the, before you can really say that this is the most exciting stimulus for this particular neuron, you have to test this. And ideally you do this in closed loop experiments as have been shown here by these papers. Um, and this is what we're currently doing. So we are um, recording cells um, to um, the natural movies. Then we calculate uh, the most um, exciting stimuli for these neurons, play, um, for, play them back to the retina, and then see if each neuron indeed responds optimal to its um, specific MEI. And that would actually be then the confirmation that these are the specific stimuli that these cells respond to. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Let me just summarize. Um, I've shown you um, that we have um, an open source spatial simulator that can be adapted to different animal species. And um, this is an important tool in order to deal with the different visual requirements of different species. And we have a mouse version that we think works very well in presenting natural scenes to the mouse retina. I showed you some analysis for our scene scam uh, movies uh, where we recorded footage of UV and green of the mouse environment. We analyzed um, specifically contrast statistics and um, think that this suggests that there's a rich chromatic information in the upper visual field of the mouse and we tested with different methods um, with this outer encoder model, but also with more st traditional statistic uh, methods, um, uh, whether um, the color opponency um, can be um, extracted from the upper visual field. We suggest that UV channel may support predator detection at dusk and dawn specifically. And in the end, I should, uh, showed you an outlook. Um, I showed you that the ganglion cells actually respond to these natural movies in an interesting way, and that we can estimate um, most interesting movies um, from the responses of these stimuli and hope to learn from that to what features in the natural scenes these ganglion cells respond the best. With this, I think I'd like to thank all the collaborators. So in red are all the, the students and postdocs who were involved in the studies and contributed different parts. And here are all the groups that directly collaborated on this work. And this is a lot of fun and I, I really enjoy it. And um, I'm hoping that you have enjoyed this and that you have questions. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Thomas. That was <clears throat> quite interesting. I mean, I have many, many questions, but they're mostly technical. I guess I'll bother you later with that. Um, to the audience, I'm just going to share uh, a link to, uh, to the current Zoom room we're in if you want to join and interact with, uh, with us. Um, we have actually quite a few questions. If. Should I just start from the top, or what is what is? Actually, actually, you have many questions, and uh, most of them concern the receptor field. Uh, I, think responses. Have to, I think you have to ask the question, and then I answer it. Yeah. So I have a question from Greg Schwartz. Are the contrast differences big enough in the receptor field of bipolar cells, approximately 1.5 degrees, for the mechanism to start there, or is this likely happening after bipolar cells? This is a good question. I think um, I think the one and a half degrees could already be uh, large enough to pick up this this difference in contrast for specific scenes. So not maybe not for all scenes, but maybe for some scenes. So it could start happening there. I, I would say, but we haven't looked uh, for smaller filters than than two degrees so far. There's a follow up from uh, Greg Schwartz as well. On average, does a dorsal retinal patch respond better to a dorsal movie than it does to a ventral movie and vice versa? Yeah, that's that's one of the motivations why we did the experiments. That would be cool, right? When you see different responses um, of ventral cells to dorsal movies and less to ventral movies. This is, we don't know yet. We think there are differences. 
Um, so when we look at the population um, in the ventral and the dorsal retina that we have so far, there, there seem to be differences in the responses, but we haven't quantified that and it's, this is a bit early, but that's clearly something that we, we want to look at. Yeah. I'm sorry for the name, I will say it wrong. I have a question from Democratis Karamonis, sorry. Does the NN model also predict the artificial stimulus responses you recorded, for example, the chirp? Uh, no, we, we haven't tested this. Um, so the, the responses that, that I showed are the raw responses from the cells that was modeled. Yeah? And currently we just use them um, to assign or to, to, to get an idea of, this, of what cell type that would be traditionally from, from, from our knowledge about how the different cell types respond to the chirps. We could then make a link to these, these previous cell types, but we haven't tested that. I have a more general question from Marla Feller. Does a mouse lens have flat transmission curve across all wavelengths? Does it have a flat transmission curve? I think Does it cut out some part of the wavelength, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, did, I, I think so, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I think I, I remember very long discussions with Frank Scheffel, who is um, a specialist on mouse lenses or lenses in general, and he did a lot of measurements. Um, I'm I'm not sure, but that's something I, I should probably check out, yeah. Uh, Marla then continue with another question, and actually we are thinking of the same in our own lab. Have you ever compared response property for, from wild coat mice versus lab mice, which are raised with very different color and contrast statistics? The question here, I guess, is mostly since those mice never seen UV, do you think that a wild mice will be more tuned to this kind of upward frequencies? Yeah. This, this would be a very interesting experiment. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really sure how to do that. We, we cannot just catch mice here in Germany. You don't have um, mice? I have to be very careful what I say here. No, I mean, sorry? <laughs> Never mind, sorry. No. So, so we, we cannot do this. We had, we, we, we had a mouse line or have a mouse line that is supposed to be genetically closer to whatever is considered the mouse original. I mean, don't quote me on that. And these mice certainly behave very differently. So they are they are not they're wild mice. They 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 are they they are really behaving differently. So and we wanted to test so whether they respond differently, but um, so far we we just looked at um, at general uh, immunohistochemical markers to compare the retina. So this is a collaboration with Christian Puller in in Oldenburg, but so far we haven't seen anything really exciting. So it looks as if their retinas are very, very similar to the normal Plex 6 mice, yeah. But I mean, in terms of what I showed at the beginning, the difference in, in photoreceptor distributions at mice that are partially closely related, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Do, do, would we see differences in a, in a more wild type mouse? Yeah. An evolution over time, yeah. That's something we are, we're wondering for the breath future. Um, I have a question from uh, George Kafetsis, one of your students. Approximately what percent of cells within the imaging field respond to the natural movies? Sorry, is that a, a which question is this? Sorry. What percentage of cells respond to your natural movies? Ah, um, depends on how you define how, how well you respond. I think, um, so if I remember that's correctly, I think the percentage of cells that give, give good responses following our quality criterion are very similar to what we get when we display um, dense noise stimuli. I think there's not much of a difference. So they're not, not obviously responding better, but also not, not obviously worse. Uh, I have one from Tom Baden. Are MEI polarities and chirp responses inverted relative to each other? Um, you mean in this presentation? Um, yeah. Sorry? No, I'm going. Sorry. No, I'm not sure. I mean, for this, we have to look at it again. I know that we had a long discussion how to show the MEIs and the, and the temporal filters correctly so that. Um, that represent the response of the cell. So this, there might be just a, a mismatch in, 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 the, in the presentation, but we can look at this afterwards, what Tom means. 
I guess we'll continue talking about that later on. Um, I have one from Martin Spasek, which was, who was apparently very interested by your drone slash hawk device. Uh, he wonders what happens to UV when the sky is completely overcast. Does that have implication on avoiding predators on cloudy days? Good question. Um, I must say I failed to uh, make my students go out in the rain or in bad weather to record movies. So they, so a surprising number of the movies we got are at very well, very nice weather. It's I don't I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, I mean, there are overcast recordings. I don't think it makes much of a difference, but I have to look at this. Good, uh, good question, yeah. Uh, I have one from Tim Golish. How different are the MEIs from classically measured receptor field, for example, with white nose? Also a good question. This is something we're comparing right now. So with these, in these closed loop experiments that we've started, we also play, um, Play other stimuli, and we also try to play the natural, uh, the dense noise together with the natural movies. Um, we don't know yet how different they are because you cannot get classically measured receptive fields from the natural movies. So you're using two different methods, I guess, to to determine um, the proper the, the features of the cells. Um, this is something that we have to look into, but um, we don't know yet. As I said, these um, MEI recordings, this is something that happened in the last three weeks or so, or four weeks. Looking forward for my results. Uh, I will finish with uh, Greg Field, who has a question and a comment. So first, he really apparently enjoyed it, and he has a suggestion to make your movie better, is just to add cats. To add what? Cats. You'll talk to him. Uh, then his question is, what are your plans for adding local motion and not flow for these movies? Yeah, we, we, we looked at the optical flow in these movies, but um, this is, I don't think it makes much sense because the optical flow represents the student who's carrying the camera. And, and whether he has shaky hands or whether he thinks he moves like a mouse, it's, um, I think this needs to be done with, um, with cameras that are mounted on, on, on the animal itself. And there are these, these movies and there are these very exciting papers that just came out. There's, I think, a preprint that came out recently where they have four cameras on the head of a mouse and they record almost everything. I think this is, uh, this is the way to go if you want to look at, at the motion statistic and the optical flow. You need something that moves like a mouse head and, and in combination, of course, with the movement of the eyes. That will be interesting to develop indeed. So thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, I encourage everybody to join us on this, uh, on this little room if you want to discuss with us, if you want to continue asking questions, or if you want some follow-up. Um, while we're waiting for others to join us, uh, I just want to say that it was very nice hosting all those to sex vision talks. Um, I know that Thomas, your lab is hosting Michael Tree Do. Trido, yeah. I'm going to try to say that uh, next week. After yeah. that, we're going to take a summer break and we will start Zoo's talk again in September on a more regular basis with Thomas Lab. So hopefully we'll see you again in September and we hope to have more talks. So, hello everyone. I see that Jeff Diamond is with us. I'm not surprised. <laughs> hello, hello Marla. You are all muted. Usual crowd filters in. <laughs> As filling up quite quickly. Jeff is Jeff, muted. You are muted. The Jeff Diamond? Why pick on me? Just besides <laughs> the obvious. Yeah. Oh my God, Thomas, that you was so muted. awesome. Usual crowd filters in. <laughs> Nice talk, Thomas. Thank you. That was awesome. Awesome, awesome. So cool. Thank you. Wait a minute. You know what I'm going to do? Me, Jeff Diamond? Besides the obvious.
Uh, Ulek, can I just ask you guys to uh, mute your YouTube videos because we hear your feedbacks through your mic? Oh my God, that was so... <laughs> so while everyone is switching off the YouTube, so Thomas, have you in the meanwhile recorded a video of a drone approaching in the UV channel? No, we haven't done this. But we, are, we, are, we, have, we get funding for, for a drone. Oh, how about a biological drone, like a bird? Yeah, this, this would be really cool. I mean, we were looking into falconers. What is this? This is the right name. So people who handle birds, where they're trained, maybe you can train them to fly onto some target and then record that. That would be really cool. But we haven't found any anyone who's doing this. Um, uh, Almut Kelber has collaborators. I can hook you up if you want in France. Yeah, yeah, OK, yeah, sure, yeah. But that would be nice, yeah. I mean, a black drone probably does the same thing, but in terms of a talk, it would be nicer to have an actual bird. Yeah. Natural wing beat statistics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those, those color opponent cells, how many of those do you have that are really color opponent in that way at the end? That was very different than the ones Katrin was showing, right? That was not a rod surround thing that was color opponent in the rf center right that yeah UV on. and do you have both I, I forget whether that was uv on green off or vice versa this was blue on uh, uv on green off yeah. okay. um not many i mean not many that we trust so this is this as, as i said this is um something that happened in the last couple of weeks and we didn't did two of these closed loop experiments one worked and the other one seemed to have worked much better, but didn't work as well. And we don't know yet why. And from the second experiment, the cell uh, came out. So we, we don't know whether it would respond to this stimulus actually the best. Yeah. But right, um, right. Yeah. You have to check that the neural network is oh. right. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting because the dense noise or everything that Katrin was doing mostly didn't pick out things that were like that, right? So it suggests that perhaps you actually might need a natural movie there. Yeah, but with the dense noise, this is also tricky. I mean, we, we tried to, to get with dense noise uh, color pond receptor fields. That's, I don't know, maybe it's the, the short um, recording time. I don't know what it is, but um, I think we are, there's just too little surround. So we, we try to play stimuli where the surround is, is more pronounced and then you, 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 you see that better. Yeah. So I think it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still a little puzzled. So I hope that we can find more cells with this MEI method um, that, that are really color opponent. And, and the cell that I showed you, that was actually also dorsal retina, which is also a bit weird. But Katrin's data showed that there are also dorsal cells that are color opponent, but just not so many. So how much data do you need before you get these MEIs? Um, so the, the, the movies are 15 minutes. But it looks as if we need a bit more, so maybe 20 minutes of, of um, recording time. And then you have to calculate these MEIs quite quickly because you want to display them to the same cells without they having be, having changed over the time course of the experiment. And that's, I think that this is the most tricky part that you have to get an estimate of the quality of the cells in the second run. Yeah. And take into account that you probably lost also some of the fluorescent dye by bleaching and so on. This is, but yeah, it seems to work. And we, uh, so yeah, the, the calculation of the MEIs is not the limiting issue currently, it's putting the ROIs reasonably into the field because it's still mostly hand checking, manually checking. Thomas, when you, you said you, were, you went back to confirm that the MEIs were really the, the MEIs, were, were you then comparing each each cell's response to its presumptive MEI with all the other MEIs? Or? That, yeah, that, that, that would be the control experiment. Okay, that's what you, you want to have a confusion matrix where you ideally have just a diagonal. Every cell responds to its MEI best. Yeah, or maybe if they are if if they have very similar MEIs, then they they cluster around the same MEI. Yeah, I mean if you compare them to what people see in the visual cortex. I mean, in the visual cortex look much more compli complicated, uh, much have GABA stripes and, and most of the MEIs that we see here, they are roughly centers around with little, little things around it. So 
it's it's not so unexpected for the retina, I would say. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think they won't be that cell specific. I mean, that's currently my guess. I'm I'm not sure. We have to see. Mala, you're muted. <laughs> so I have a question about that, and this is very naive. You guys are all much more familiar with these methods. But, you know, when people have done reverse correlation in the past, like with EJ, there's been this argument about this linearity, right, of being able to do this, this reverse correlation based on assumptions of, of linear, of, um, that, that didn't apply to using natural scenes, right? So EJ has made a big point about there being any structure in the stimulus made that not legitimate mathematically. Right for the reverse correlation. So, how can you just kind of explain to me, having heard EJ talk about this for like decades, why it's okay to use an MEI to identify an MEI? His argument for that? No, so, no. Uh, uh, my argument for using MEIs. Um, yeah. As far as did EJ approve of you using MEIs? I guess maybe that's another way yeah. <laughs> to phrase so, it. So, I mean, first of all, I think I've never talked. Um, had, had a talk with so little knowledge about what I'm talking about. So I'm learning a lot of stuff about the MEIs and so on. This is, this is really, this is, I think it's exciting, but I'm still learning. So as I understand them is that you're, um, compared to the traditional methods, you're, you're, um, you're letting the, the, the network finding the best fitting movie. And that allows also, um, this is a, this is a non-linear linear process. So you're, it's not the same thing as the traditional linear regression approach. So I think it's um, I think it gives you more more degrees of freedom, um, and therefore. Right, but I guess EJ would make the argument if you were going to say that that stimulus caused the spike train, right? That you had to assume that there was this this linear relationship, and that's why you had to use an unstructured stimulus in order to do that. I, I don't know, you know, Greg, someone else can probably make this argument better. And so yeah, case, yeah, it, it, it does, it's, it solves that. It, it mostly solves, I mean, it solves it statistically with, as long as it's not overfit, it'll do uh -huh. it, right? As long as the neural network actually converges on something reasonable, it won't have to, but there's always a danger in a neural network approach yeah. like that, that you just get a garbage thing out because it didn't I mean, train well enough. I mean, you can always get that, but it is, allows for spatial nonlinearities, I believe, and all sorts yeah. of no, I mean, this is why we restricted the number of kernels that it can use um, to, to uh -huh. make sure that it's not overfitting. Um, and um, so, I, I mean, as, as an experimentalist, I think the, 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 the step is really the closed loop experiment. You have to show that it responds better um, to its own MEI, and then maybe even better to, if you, if you then get um, the receptive field, I mean, from, from a, you do a, the stimulus based on a traditional noise stimulus and calculate this, this preferred stimulus and then compare, and it should also respond better to its MEI. That would be the ultimate test. Mm -hmm. But that, that works is, I don't know. Yeah, but it would be. Yeah. yeah, thumbs up. I don't know that anyone's actually done that for any mm -hmm. like neural network. I mean, it's, very, it's similar to maximum informative dimensions, but I don't know that that direct comparison has been made either. With that idea. Yeah. Do you, how, would, how would you go about analyzing the differences in the MEI and the, um, the spike trigger average, the, the, the linear approach? When you got those two things and the MEI elicits a better response, um, how, how, how do you, what, what do you do to, to distinguish what the, what the elements are in the MEI? that aren't in the linear uh, result? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, you can directly compare the, the two kernels and see what, what is the difference and what, what features make it respond better. And then you could, I, I guess you could try to take features, put this on a linear filter and see when it happens to become better or not. So, so something like this, you, you morph them into each other, see what, what is the key feature that makes it respond to better? I guess that's a, yeah, it has a lot of dimensions as problem. Could be, 
I mean, could be the temporal the timing of of the two color channels, for example. Yeah. Thomas, can can I ask a question about um, optics? So when you're making these movies, um, I guess there's a question about um, mouse eyes. Do do mice accommodate? Is there any accommodation? I think that or, or is it, yeah. So that it's just as blurry near as it is far for, for the mouse. Uh, yes, I mean this is. I mean Frank Frank Scheffel claims that everything from distance of two centimeters is basically this in in, in focus for the mouse. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the specialty of the mouse eye and the advantage of it being small. I just see that Lara is now in the Zoom. So everything concerning MEIs, you can ask her. She she knows this much, much, much better than me. But Roland, so you, you well, it's whether it's reasonable to use um, this kind of lens and just have everything in focus or so. Yeah, I think it's, I would say it's a reasonable assumption. What, what is a bit unclear, so, so the one reason why we take these central um, crops of the image is also, I mean, Tom pointed this out in comments to the manuscript, that are chrom chromatic aberrations that you cannot prevent really towards the edges of the lens. And um, I think in the center, they, they, they are fine. But if you're um, going towards the edges, you have uh, certain chromatic aberrations. And that's, I mean, somebody asked this, I think, in the, in the question list whether wasn't that the, the question? What about chromatic aberrations in the mouse eye? No, oh, this was the flat transmission curve for the wavelength. So it goes in the same direction. Yeah. So how much of the retina is your stimulus covering? How much of the retina? Um, I'm just wondering about sort of longer range interactions. It was 30 degrees, the official angle that's on the on the retina. That's one millimeter, is that right? So a big chunk. Yeah. Hmm. Hey, Thomas, I was wondering why did you choose to use a fisheye lens? Is it really just so that you could project it across more of the retina somewhat representatively? Or was there some other mm, reason? Yeah, I mean, I think the decision was at the beginning we wanted to have the camera um, match the properties as close as, as possible to the mouse. And mouse eye has almost 180 degrees. So seeing really the movies from the mouse perspective. But then it's, it's really difficult to deal with the um, spatial distortions at the edge of the lens. So in the end, we, we decided to use these central crops. But I mean, in, in terms of visualizing what, what might be the input of the mouse eye, I think it's, it's still useful to do this. Um, but if you want to have better optic, optics, you probably would replace this by a smaller field of view lens. Hey, Thomas. I was thinking about the data you showed about the differences across color and on-off contrast, dorsal versus ventral, and then the differences or how it behaves across receptive field size. And I was just wondering, in the dorsal retina, we have a lot larger receptive field sizes, right? We have that in the mouse retina, we have that in the guinea pig retina, and I was wondering if you ever considered you know, um, how that then behaves and how it then really looks for, looks for the mouse, if you consider these differences. And, and why, why do we have then larger receptive field sizes in the dorsal retina? It's probably not because there's less information. Maybe it's to pick up then more of that little contrast you have in the uh, lower visual field or something like that. Did did you ever think about that, or did I miss something? I don't know. Mm, no, I'm not sure how to re relate this really. But but uh, did you get my point? You're saying there's a mismatch between the receptive field size. That's not not necessarily a mismatch. Maybe it's a perfect match depending on 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 the function. You know what I mean? You you have larger receptive fields in the dorsal retina. To be more sensitive, you mean? I don't know. 
Is, is that a general feature or type specific? Things? I'm, I'm not aware of this. Has it's, this been done? it's a little bit type specific, but generally I would think just based on the general density distribution in mouse and also in guinea pig, um, there are exceptions because I mean, um, you know, the, the alpha uh, ganglion cells in the mouse or, or whatnot, or you have the, of course, in the guinea pig, you have the actual streak where it's different. But if you look like really dorsal periphery, um, there are so few cells basically. So they, they must almost all, all types must be larger. I mean, if you say dorsal periphery, that looks straight down, right? There's probably a huge amount of motion noise there. It's, I, I wouldn't, I mean, it, it, it's not straight down. It, it will, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I mean, not straight down, but it's closer to the ground. And I think totally, yeah, yeah. Their, their motions would be much faster. So you could also speculate that you need larger cells in order to, to pick up um, motion differences better. I mean, I don't know. And wasn't there this, this paper in, about the, the V1 visual cortex in mice with the different motion statistics in different parts of the visual field? Didn't you comment on this, Tom? That was that came out like yesterday or something, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I did comment, but I forgot what I said. I think they're showing that there, there seem to be different preferences for motion in the upper and the lower visual field. I mean, uh, yeah, the lower visual field likes motion more. Yeah, yeah. And, something like that. Yeah, and then you, yeah, I think you said, yeah, well, flow fields and so on. Yeah, yeah because fish, fish do do that. So Ari Arenberg showed that. Yeah, so it seems to be similar to mouse. But then it's... Must, no. yeah. Can I, could I um, ask about ecology then a little bit? How, how much time does, do mice spend out in the open? Um, how much? This is I mean, that I read at the beginning. No, no, no. <laughs> no I, I'm just wondering if, should we all be, if we want to do serious experiments on mice now, do we have to set up a UV system as the one, like the one you've been show, you, you showed, or, or how much? I mean, mice also spend a lot of time um, moving around at night, or probably most of the time moving around at night, right? And so for the most part, you could argue that they're, they're using their rod system and that, that we could study the mouse retina just through their rods. But what are your comments on that? I mean, I'm, I mean you, you probably know also the papers where they, where they study mouse activity during the year and depending on how much food is available when they come out. So if there's enough food, food available, then they stay wherever they are and, and come out at night. So, but if, if food is rare, they come also, they, they extend their activity periods. And I mean, my, from my personal experience, if, if I walk here around tubing, you see mice everywhere. Yeah, I'm, so I think they're not active just during night, they're active whenever nobody's disturbing them. Yeah. Because, I mean, but um, I guess you could argue. I, I don't know. I, I would I would argue against this. I wouldn't say. Yeah, that I think it's an I think it's an interesting point though, just to think about the fact that in parallel, the whole system has to work in the night and in the day, right? Like there are probably motion statistics. There are probably interesting differences in nighttime to dorsal ventral and those might be very different than the ones that are around during the day and that all has to work in parallel right you can't you only have one set of ganglion cells and yeah. every other kind of cells so it's kind of it's it's an interesting question i mean there are owls at night that eat mice right yeah there's all kinds of so, they still have to run they still have to move yeah. right all the motion statistics are still still there although with you know different absolute luminance but, yeah. but the, the the owls will still use their cones when the mice have to use their rods right because of the huge eyes so it's a bit unfair <laughs> you think that matches don't they all smell them no just kidding but don't they also have rods they do yeah owls? and they use them yeah. obviously but the, the point is that the big eyes of the owl means that they can use cones when the mice can't assuming that they're equally sensitive which we don't know yeah. They use auditory cues as well, right? The owls. Yeah. Yeah. You could also argue that, that the rods, I mean, since the rods um, seem to be active also at high light levels, so they, they play a role in, at, at every time and you have to consider them anyways also in the, 
in the interplay with the with the UV signals. Maybe one should define the rod cone as a functional unit in the mouse because it's. I mean, probably whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you're finding three for the receptor. Yeah. Too many. Yeah, it's <laughs> steady just... on, steady on. <laughs> I do think this question, though, about how we're studying lab mice, I mean, maybe it really doesn't matter. So maybe, you know, visual experience doesn't matter at all for how these circuits wire up, and that's possible. But I mean, the more natural scene stuff I see from mice, the more deprived I think our lab mice are, right? They, I mean, their UV cones are like never stimulated, ever, right? And it's hard to imagine that that um, doesn't impact something about the downstream circuits, but it might not. Oh yeah, and Michaela's paper had that, those amazing wild caught like UV clumps, right? Yeah. Like she, like she found a few in Israel, I guess, and they have like these this insane clumping of the UV cones, like, as if there's a circuit sitting underneath them. That that was just in the supplement of her paper, but I thought that was amazing. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly, I was thinking of that. And, you know, there's all these, whenever you talk to people who have done even brain plasticity, people have done like, you know, uh, LTP in a wild caught mouse and it works entirely differently. You know, so there seems to be evidence that, uh, but of course these are wild caught. And as Thomas has pointed out, there's many different species. I don't know what species they were or subspecies, but it was, uh, I don't know. It, 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 it does, um, make me think we need to, even if we don't do wild caught mice, that maybe we can come up with ways of raising the mice in cages, that at least they have some sort of visual, you know, UV stimulation versus zero, right? It, it, it could be interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. I just say guinea pig. Thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I know this is really for Thomas, but I just want to convey a very little, short little story. <laughs> so sorry to interrupt here, but we had um, Gerald Westheimer come to our lab meeting yesterday. And Gerald Westheimer is the one who brought Horace Bar Barlow to Berkeley to look for the discovery of direction and selectivity. And I asked him to tell us the story. And so I just want to tell you very briefly um, that the discovery of direction selective ganglion cells apparently uh, is very similar to Hubel and Wiesel finding that orientation was important, you know, in cortex, and that there was like one researcher at Berkeley who was doing rabbits. Nobody else was doing rabbits at that time. Everybody was using cats and primates. Was Roland? What was that? Was this Roland? Oh, well, it was it Roland? <laughs> <laughs> Little, I think his name was. Is it Little? Is that right, Roland? No. I can't. And. Uh, and so Gerald Westheimer convinced Horace to come to Berkeley because they were all looking for for primary components of perception. Like what are the, the primary components of what you know, people can see? And, um, and so they put electrodes in the rabbits and while they were setting up for the experiment, they shone a flashlight on the ceiling and the flashlight went in one direction and they saw lots of spikes. The flashlight went in the other direction, they didn't see any. And that's when they started studying direction selectivity in the rabbits. And so they did like this short little series of experiments while they were here and then they stopped working on it. Everyone stopped working on it because nobody was working on the rabbit and a field was born. So there you go. Just wanted to <laughs> convey that little, little story. I recommend everyone invite Gerald Westheimer. He's 95 years old, incredibly lucid, wonderful to talk to about the history of neuroscience if any of you are interested. He's very open to doing this. Cool. Hey, Mala, I'm very interested. All right, you but, should. But because he's the father of the Stab Crawford effect, right? He, he studied a lot of the Stab Crawford effect. Wait, well, we can organize a little chat with Gerald if you'd like. I think. Yeah, that I'd would... love to. Thanks. Okay. Please, please count me in on that. Gerald Westheimer is the reason I study the retina. Oh, wow. Oh. Well, I, I had no on. idea what, what I was doing. And first year of graduate school, he taught the retina lectures. In the in the Berkeley neurobiology course, yeah, and that was it. So well, he's originally uh, from Berlin, actually. So he talks a lot. Yeah, he has a great history. So oh, well, anyway, I'm sorry to defray the to divert the conversation, but no, Mala, maybe you can organize a social with him. Yeah, I could organize a social with Gerald. That is such a great idea. Okay, I will do what I can. So like a, like a beer hour, or so online a virtual beer hour. You mean a virtual beer like, hour? Yeah. Of course, of course, yeah. 
since we moved to a different topic, I just want to let you know, uh, thanks for coming. I'm just going to hand up the stream now. So this discussion will now be private. Sorry, I forgot to do it. Earlier. Well, this discussion private. wasn't private? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're going to give it a dose. It's going to be citable. <laughs> Is that all just happening on YouTube? <laughs> and now we can be honest. Yeah, Thomas, that talk sucked. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's a there's a there's a 